Good morning. Welcome to Unite. Please have a seat. We'll get started. Thank you for being here with us. We have uh, several things to go over just briefly. Um, we want to keep in prayer um, Anna Lee Gilbert. Um, actually, Anna Lee Gilbert passed away. I'm sorry. Uh, Anna Lee Gilbert passed away last Sunday night, Monday morning. Keep in Annabelle Greenlee? Yes. yes, that's who I said. Thank you. Um, Mary Pearson was here for the first service, and um, they uh, had a, Mary had a nice uh, tribute to her sister, so it was um, um, a very good thing. Uh, there won't be any formal services for her, so, um, but the, today's uh, celebration was uh, with her sister Mary, and it was a great, great service this morning. Um, the men's, next men's prayer breakfast will be coming up on March 21st at 8 o'clock. It's always going to be the third Saturday of the month at 8 o'clock. The um, church is going to hold a celebratory wedding next Saturday with the Dandoran uh, family with uh, Kelsey Sunman and um, Michael Dandoran's service next Saturday. So all that to say is this auditorium needs to be cleared of its chairs after this service. Uh, this afternoon. So if any of you could stay and help us do that, all these chairs need to go in that um, right-hand door, first closed door right there, stacked in there. Um, the service will have their own chairs brought in for the service for the uh, wedding. And then once the wedding is over next Saturday evening, uh, anybody who has time who can come back to the church building around 6.37 p.m. next Saturday night to reset up these chairs as you see them now would be much appreciated. So um, any, any volunteers for those two counts, both this afternoon after this service and next Saturday evening. Um, the PGMB class goes on uh, as usual at uh, 1045, as does Randy's class on Wednesday nights. And we have um, today, our speaker will be Emily Hipwell, and next Sunday will be uh, Karen Clark. Um, beyond that, uh, I'll let you know week to week as it goes. The uh, Crittenden Care Center will be coming up on March 29th in about four weeks. Um, that'll take the place of this service on that day down in Fullerton where we've been before to uh, service the kids and work with the kids there. It was a great blessing uh, the last time we were there. Um, and Leanne Rorix, who has spoken here at Unite several times, is back from China. Uh, she's still in that two-week quarantine period. So uh, hopefully sometime later this week, she'll be uh, out of that and she can move freely about. Um, so we're, I am actually kind of curious to hear how her experience was in China and getting back here and getting over. Uh, she doesn't have the disease, um, the coronavirus I'm speaking about, but the, uh, they have to kind of quarantine her until uh, the two week period is up. So we'll hope that goes well throughout the next couple of days. So if you would, please stand and greet someone next to you. We will get started, and welcome. We are glad you are here today. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we have a special announcement just to remind you, if you haven't already met him, we have a new youth intern, Kevin, D or Kevin, Kenan Doro. Uh, Kenan, will you come on up here? So if you haven't heard yet, uh, I heard some people weren't here for the announcement, so we're gonna embarrass him again. Kenan. <laughs> Kenan is a junior at Hope International University, and we are so excited that he will be serving the next year as our youth intern. Um, Kenan, will you tell everybody what's interesting about you? Oh, yeah. 
Um, so more like background, I'm from Washington State originally, uh, moved out here just for school. But the thing that Mari is referring to is I'm colorblind, partially colorblind. Um, and so the first thing that a lot of people like to do when they find out that I'm colorblind is play the color game with me and see how bad I am at it. Which is terrible. Which, yeah, but you know, at this point, it just happens so frequently, it doesn't feel bad anymore. I just, it's like, yeah, you know, I think that's purple, but it's actually dark blue, or vice versa, and it's just, it's just a thing now. So, so if you want to play the color game with me, it's totally fine. If you're just interested to, you know, hear what colors are like from my point of view, wrong, but, you know. <laughs> Um, I was actually just saying, like, oh, explain yourself. Not that oh. the, that the, your co your color blindness is the only interesting thing about you. Well, for now. He played baseball and soccer, I did. and he was a catcher, I was a catcher. in I was baseball. A very small catcher, because I grew a lot um, going into my high school career. So. Yeah, so uh, we're so excited. If you haven't uh, met Kenan, please talk to him. Talk to him. Please welcome him into our family. We, we can't wait to see how God uses him here. So uh, thanks, Kenan, for, for being here with us. Everyone, yeah, give him a round of applause. He's really cool. He showed us a, a fun game on Wednesday and uh, made us look really dumb, but it was really fun for the students. So uh, that, that was awesome. All right, everybody, welcome to Unite. We are so excited you are here. Please stand and join us as we start worshiping the Lord together.
You give life, you are love. 
You may be seated for our children's song. Will you please welcome up our amazing little worship leader? Like every teacher, I enjoy spelling, so we're going to spell Christian today. Well, the last time I was up here was about a year ago, um, and I was telling someone earlier that I basically get the nerve to go do this about once a year, but I'm doing it again in like six weeks, so we'll see what happens. Um, where's my thingy? All right. So I'm going to start off our um, talk today with a big shocker, uh, a medical story. <laughs> so um, as some of you know, I'm a medical assistant. Uh, so when you're sitting in the lobby and somebody opens the door and calls your name and you know you walk back to the room, you sit down, I ask you a couple of questions, make sure your chart is all in order for the provider to see you. So right now I work in orthopedics, which muscles and bones. So a patient comes in, um, this is kind of a standard patient, but a patient comes in, they're complaining of back pain. It's pretty severe, it's getting worse for a while, so we go and order an x-ray. So they come back from x-ray, I walk into the room, with the spinal surgeon I work for, she's fantastic, and this image comes up. Yep, it's real wonky. <laughs> so in essence, I won't tell you exactly how this uh, visit usually goes, but basically she walks in, she pulls up the image and says, hey, I'm a spinal surgeon, your spine is crooked and I can make it straight. I know the most tested, the most reliable, the best way to fix it, I've done it 2,000 times and I have a 100% success rate and it eliminates 100% of your pain. And well, that's amazing, that's great, right, look at this. But me, even me, knowing quite a bit about anatomy and physiology, I sit here and I look at this picture, I'm like, that's gonna be kind of complicated and seems a little impossible, there's a lot that needs to go on, it's gonna be a long surgery, it's gonna be pretty risky, and there's gonna be a long recovery time. So as I'm thinking through all this, I look at the patient's face, and their face mirrors exactly the thoughts I just had. So, you know, they just walked in, they said they have back pain, and suddenly there's a surgeon sitting in front of them saying, this, 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 you need surgery, I'm gonna straighten it. And the patient opens their mouth to ask a question. And this, is, this moment is where I wanna focus today. So, there's basically two types of patients, and they ask a very similar question, um, or they ask two questions that sound really similar, but they're not. So, the first question they ask, or the patient number one usually asks, um, really, are you sure? And it's incredible because the spinal surgeon just said, I've done this 2,000 times, I have a 100% success rate, blah, blah, blah. But the patient is still so shocked and so unbelieving. Patient number two, though, almost always asks, okay, yeah, no, I believe you, I don't get it, though. Like, I look like this, and you say I'm gonna look like this. So, can you explain how? And these two questions are also where I want to focus. So how can I be sure basically implies a place of non-confidence. I want you to help me be confident. No, I don't need an explanation. I'm just not sure it can happen. It's an if mentality. And you're basically needing more proof. Whereas the second question, how will you do it? It's already coming from a place of I believe you but I just need an explanation. I don't know medicine, I just need you to explain to me how you're gonna go from curvy to straight. Um, 
And there's no sense of, of if. It's when this happens, can you explain how? So let's, let's go back to the, the two patients. Patient number one, the spinal surgeon says, I have 100% success rate. And the patient goes, um, how can I be sure? Any surgeon you say that to, you're going to watch the anger spread over their face. And <laughs> they're going to say, I'm not here to make you confident. I'm not here to convince you of my stats. I'm here to help you, and I'm here to heal your pain. And then we'll go on from there. But the patient number two who says, oh, OK, no, I believe you, but how? Please tell me how. That same surgeon, you're going to see her get her game face on, and she's going to say, OK, we're going to do step one and two. We're going to do step three and four, and that's when we're actually going to straight. We're going to distract. We're going to compress. We're going to make it straight. Then we're going to solidify it with step five and six, and then we're going to make it straight. And every time the patient says, OK, I get it. I understand you, because I came from a place of confidence, and now that I see your plan, I, I'm, in, I'm on board. They get their spine straightened. Everyone lives happily ever after. So these two patients, why, am I, why are you telling this to me, Emily? Why did you just lead me through the scoliosis story? So these two patients end up being two characters in the Bible. Um, and one more point I want to focus on with these patients that will come back later is that first patient that says, how can I be sure, doctor, even though you've just told me all these stats, when they go on to recommend that surgeon to a friend, can you imagine saying, like, yeah, this Surgeon said she had this great success rate, but I'm still not, not sure. It seems so impossible. Do you think that friend is going to go to that surgeon? Probably not. But that second patient who said, uh, I was super confused, but she laid it out straight. She like totally uncurled all of my questions, and now my spine is straight. You have to go see her. How much stronger is that second recommendation? So keep that in mind. Um, so like I said, these two patients end up basically being a char two characters in Luke chapter 1. So I'll read this to you pretty emphatically. Um, the first we'll talk about Zechariah. So in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. But what, once Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for burning of incense had came, all of the assembled worshipers were praying outside. But then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people to Israel, to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit of power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteousness and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So essentially, Zechariah is this priest. He's been doing his priestly duties for a long time. So then this angel appears to him, tells him he's going to be a dad. And not only that, but his son's going to be incredible. He's going to do all these super great things. I have a 100% success rate. I've done the surgery 2,000 times. <laughs> really? Are you sure? I don't know about this. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day it happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting outside for Zechariah, wondering why he stayed in the temple so long. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And he, they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs and, and was still remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, but for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and has taken away my disgrace among the people. 
So we, I told you earlier about how to speak to a surgeon 101, if that, you consider that a class. Well, this is how not to speak to an angel. And this is an <laughs> upper division class with real consequences. If you don't believe what Gabriel says, you're going to lose your voice. You're not going to have an angry surgeon on your hands. So it, pretty incredible, right? Patient number one is kind of like Zechariah, where they're like, um, yeah, you say all these really great things, and this is literally the answer to, answer to my prayers. I'm going to have this great child, but um, I don't know. I, how can I really be sure? So patient number two, or Mary, is our next character. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, that's the same angel Gabriel, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. I'm sure I'm here. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be, kind of like Zechariah. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. I'm a spinal surgeon. I'm going to make your spine straight. How amazing is this? But even bigger, basically this angel appears to Mary, who she thinks is just a random person, and says, you're going to give birth to the king of the universe forever and ever. Isn't that fantastic? And what do you think she says? How will this be? She's like, yeah, okay, what? <laughs> how will this be, Mary answered, since I am a virgin? Uh, how can you make my spine straight because it's crooked? I, I believe you, I just I don't understand. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come over you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, who is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And the angel left her. So pretty incredible. Mary's just this teenager kind of doing her business, and she's told that she this pretty incredible thing is going to happen. In Perhaps it's arguable, but I think this is a crazier thing than just like a spinal surgery. So, so I really want to compare and contrast these two characters because I think this is really where we're going to find um, somewhere that, that we can draw our own response from. So just to compare them, they're both terrified, we know, because Gabriel told them so. Um, and they're both probably really confused. Zechariah was just doing his job, whereas... And Mary was just kind of going about her life, and this angel appears to them, and they're terrified. But also, when you step back and really think about it, these were gut reactions. They didn't have time to sit and consider. They didn't have time to talk to their friends about what was happening. This was their gut reaction to the angel. Um, and that's kind of where the comparison stops. So as we know, Zechariah didn't believe right away. He was like, how can I be sure that you're, you're telling me this right thing? How can I, how can I be sure this is actually going to happen? Whereas Mary actually believed, and she was just asking how. She just wanted an explanation because virgin birth is impossible, and she knows it. Secondly, even if they both did have a beat to think about it, there's precedent for Zechariah, because even Isaac, or even Abraham and Sarah conceived in their old age, when Sarah was 90. But even if Mary had thought about it, there's no precedent for her. It's still kind of impossible. Finally, <laughs> Zechariah has been... It's literally his job for however long he's been alive to serve and believe God and to trust him. And Mary's just a teenager. So I guess in business terms, like Zechariah has experience in this field and he still couldn't believe. Whereas Mary, she's so young, she's still just a teenager. How could she have possibly trusted that what the angel was telling her, except that's the place she was already coming from was confidence in God. And then we obviously know their consequences were different. Zechariah lost his voice, but Mary received the blessings and is now Mary, the, the mother of our Savior. So, so even just thinking about it straightforward, when you doubt God like Zechariah did, you lose your voice. And this is where I want to take the last couple, last couple of minutes here to, to hammer it home. There's a really important thing we're missing, that when our 
when we're in the, that moment, when we're scared, when we're confused, when we don't have time to sit and talk to our friends or our family or think it over, how do we respond to God? Do we say, um, are you sure? Or I don't know. Or do we go, yes, Lord, show me how. So, so think about everything we've already talked about. How can I be sure versus how will you do it? And guys, we've already, we haven't had Gabriel come to us, but God has already given us his word. He's already told us what's going to happen. But yet we still ask things like, how can I be sure I'm going to make it through this month? How can I be sure I'm going to have enough money? I'm going to get through retirement. Okay, I'm going to have enough for my college, my kid's college fund. How do we still ask him for sure when he's already given us his word? Today, I want to encourage us to change the way we're responding to God. We need to say, God, how will you provide for us? How will you bring me through this month? How will you give me what I need? In, in John 8, John 8, 36, um, this is when he said, um, anyone that the sun sets free is free indeed. Yet, when we, when we feel guilt, when we feel shame, when that we're laying in bed at night and that horrible thought comes to us and we're like, God, how am I sure I'm still free from this? How am I sure that I'm, I'm guiltless? We need to change that thought that when we're just by ourselves, you don't have time to think through it, you need to think, God, how will you set me free? How will I be free from this? And this next one I love so much because so many people in the church say, oh, all the duties are already used or I'm not useful here, I'm not needed. But in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, this is when God says every, every, every body has a place in this church, that every piece of the body has, has a use. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weak are indispensable. Basically, God has placed every single person in the church for a use. So how can you still go to church every day or church every week and say, how am I useful here? I'm not useful here. You need to change it and you say, God, how will you use me? How will you use me here? How will you help me help others? How will you help me help this community? Not how can I be sure that I am? And there's one really big one that I want to touch on today that I want to leave you with. Jesus himself has sent us out. Jesus himself has said, go make disciples. Go out into the community. Go bring people to my kingdom. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded with you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I stand up here, guys. I still struggle with, God, are you sure you want me to do this? <laughs> are you? I mean... I can do something medical if you really want. I can, like, heal people. I might straighten spines one day. Do you really want me to make disciples? I do this, too. I think we all do. God, are you sure this is what you want from me? It is. God has already come. He, Jesus has already told us this is what's going to happen. And our response, our knee-jerk response, guys, needs to be how. God, how are you going to get me to do this? I'm up here, which I didn't think I was going to be, and here I am. <laughs> I posted on my Instagram story earlier this week telling people I'm going to speak in front of church, which I don't usually do, and that terrified me. What if my coworkers came and saw me here? Those types of things. My whole point in, in being so emphatic about this is those, those moments where we don't have time to stop and think, that you were saying, that neighbor that we don't, we're not sure as Christian, that coworker that may need to hear Jesus, Jesus love, or that, that cashier that you are like, ah, I think you, you need some help. I, I want to step out and say something. Don't think, how can I be sure this is it? God, how will you use me? How will you use me in this moment? And like I said, I'm so guilty of not knowing if it's the right moment. I'm not sure if this is where I'm supposed to be because I'm a medical assistant. God, how will you use me? All I have is medicine. How will you use me, God? I'm a teacher. I'm an economist. I'm a cook. How are you going to tell me to make disciples when this is not what I am? Put, insert yourself in this. God, how will you help me make disciples since I am just? Insert yourself. And I was going over this last night, and I got to this slide, and I was like, 
what am I going to tell them? I don't have the answer, God. I don't know. So I was reading scripture and I was pouring over scripture and Connor came in and he was like, what's taking you so long? And I'm like, I don't know. So I read over this next one and I, I, I think I found it. So Jesus is telling his disciples in this passage, I'm going to send you out. It's going to be tough. Think it's we're not going to get flogged and, and whipped and things that the di- disciples were told. However, at the very end, Jesus says, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Praise God, because my words aren't great. So guys, in that moment, when we are Zechariah and when we are Mary, and we're, we're about to open our mouth because what God has told us to do seems really impossible, He's going to speak through us. It's not going to be our voice. So think back to Zechariah when he says, how can I be sure? And I'm thinking there, I'm sitting here thinking, God, how can I be sure? I lose my voice and I thwart God's voice. But when your knee-jerk response is, yes, God, how will you use me? We use our voice and it's his voice. And then we get to, we get to move God's voice around all of our community, around the world. So this is what I implore of you today, guys. In that, that next time you have that moment where you're about to ask God, like, are you sure you want this of me? Change it. Think of me just standing up here. I, don't, I never thought I was going to be up here, but here I am. Because I think this is how God is using me. And I know he will use you. You just have to ask him how. Because no word from God will ever fail. you pray with me? Dear God, we... Are in so, we're so in awe of you. We praise you for your perfection, for your inability to fail. And I pray for every single person who's, who's listening now or for every single person who's going to make it here today. Work in them, God. Speak through them. Help them to be a stronger, more confident version of, of themselves. Um, we just love you so much, God. And we are so thankful for your son, and for your love, and that we get this amazing opportunity to go out and make disciples. It really is a privilege, and it is this amazing good news that you've given us. So God, please use us and show us how so we can be confident. And in Jesus' amazing name we pray. Amen. Emily, you're awesome. (laughs) Uh, And you know what's amazing is when the Holy Spirit speaks... Um, and unites things in, uh, in planning because we're singing a song called Yes, I Will. And in those times when God calls us out, our response should not be like, no, that's not possible. Oh, no, not me. It should be just, yes, I will. And the song starts off by saying, I count on one thing, this same God that never fails, will not fail me now, will not fail me now. If he hasn't then, why now? He won't fail us now. So Will you please stand and sing with us this song? And as we're singing, think about those things that he is calling us out on. Uh, what, what, What is he calling you to do? What are those moments of opportunity that we are being called to say, yes, I will to? Um, so let's sing this song loud.
Traditionally, we think of communion as a time for um, personal reflection or personal intercession. And I don't suppose that there's anything wrong with that, but really, when it was instituted, it wasn't about the individual. It's about the group. Think, when Jesus did it, Tim and all his disciples, and they're thinking about one another. And they're investing in one another. I mean, Paul even kind of admonishes us. It's not about doing communion all by yourself. Communion means community. It means to not just be together, but to be with each other. And what is it we're doing when we're with each other? Well, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Well, he's talking about remembering all of the things that Jesus did when they were facing his crucifixion and something they really didn't understand. It's, let's look at all the things he's already done, the healing and the preaching and the changing of lives. So we remember what God has already done because... He's done amazing things. He's brought children into our lives. He's brought spouses. He brings us jobs. He brings us the strength to keep going in difficult circumstances. And when we think about the things and we share with each other in our communion, the things that he has already done, so we're remembering what's already been done, that gives us hope. Even if I don't know, how will this be? How can this be done? I have faith that he's done some pretty amazing things previous to this. And so while I do not know what this new solution is going to be like, I know he's a God who cares and heals and leads and gives us voices. This meal isn't the point. It's the vehicle. It, it was meant as a time to, to draw us together. So I would encourage you, as you participate in this meal, as you take a piece of bread, as you drink the cup, talk to somebody next to you and remember something, something that God has done for you. Remind them that he is capable, that he is, that he does do this. He's got this, as it were talk to someone because they might need to hear exactly what that remembrance is that you have to share with them because that may be exactly maybe what Mary was thinking about or what Zachariah could have been thinking about is okay I have no idea how I was going to do this but he did this so as you're comfortable 
share in your community here as we're taking this meal. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for being here, for drawing us all here, for making us a body, a strange, wonderful, amazingly chaotic and individual body where you've given each one of us a voice to use in different ways, that each one of us is a valuable part of this body. I praise you, Father, for the presences of all of the people here. And I thank you for the opportunity to be part of a body with them. Would you please come and be with us now? In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us for this last song. If you feel so led, would you join us at the front um, as one body? And let's just sing loud in one voice. You can gather right here and we'll sing Amazing Grace as our last song. Amazing Grace. Yeah. 
such an amazing gift, the gift of the fellowship of the people we're surrounded by, the, the gift of, of the example and, and the life in your son, Lord, Lord, teach us, teach us to say, how do you need me, Lord? How do you need me to be part of this? What, what do you need me to do? Help us to, help us to respond to that amazing grace in, in in the spirit in which in the spirit in which your son responded, Lord, in the spirit in which Mary responded. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen, everybody. It is so good to do life with you all and to worship our Lord and Savior together. Please look for opportunities to say, yes, I will. And how will you do it rather than are you sure to God? So have an amazing week. We will see you next Sunday. Love you all. Bye.